Welcome to the Mid-Ohio Quote Track Side Classroom. This topic is how to do the basics better. It's designed for solo and advanced drivers and instructors who are looking to improve their driving skills. And I hope each of you takes away one or two tips that you can, uh, you can apply in uh, your event at Mid-Ohio and at, uh, at, at future events. <clears throat> so official topic, how to improve, do the basics better. Let me start with a little story. <clears throat> I once had the pleasure to have David Murray drive my car at Watkins Glen. And besides the fact that he's obviously smoother and, and able to do a number of things that I can't do, the thing that amazed me the most was how fast he could get on the brake pedal without upsetting the car. When I try to get on the brakes that fast, it inevitably pitches the car forward much more than he did. And <clears throat> I got to thinking about that. I've asked people about it. And then the light bulb went on. He's practiced that maneuver probably a thousand or 10,000 times more than I have. In other words, we're talking about a very basic technique, but here's a pro that does it better than I do. And that shouldn't be a surprise, I suppose. But that, I hope, illustrates the point I want to make that doing better on track really revolves around doing the basics better. So with all that said, <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, the normal disclaimer that if you try something that's here and it doesn't work, it's your fault. Uh, not mine or the clubs or PCAs. Now, just to reinforce, uh, it's not just me saying doing the basics better. Here's Ross Bentley saying the main difference between the best and the rest. Uh, number one, focus on the basics. The advanced stuff is just doing the basics better. You know, witness the David Murray comment. Uh, they also are committed to learning and they prepare. And here's an elaboration on that. When they're working on the basics, they approach practice in a deliberate way, a focused way. And that results in them mastering the advanced stuff. Many of you have heard me talk about deliberate practice in the past. That's exactly what he's talking about here. I'm not going to cover that today. We've covered that in other sessions. But um, here's reinforcement for, the, uh, for why you should use deliberate practice. Um, and we want to learn and we want to prepare. Here's another way to think about the same topic. The big idea is there is no single big idea. Progress at the advanced level is the sum of many small improvements and a gain of a tenth or a few tenths that you can repeat is excellent progress. And if you get better, think about the pros, they go after hundreds, right? So you go after smaller gains as, as you get better. So to, to get started, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about some ways that you can get better, but here are some fundamentals. So if you're a student driver watching this uh, <clears throat> or someone with limited experience, you may need to focus on these things before some of the other things I'm going to talk about in a minute. <clears throat> Do you drive a consistent line? emphasis on consistent, and use the full width of the track. Do you know, Are you on the gas and unwinding the wheel all the way from apex to track out? Do you recognize early and late turn in and adjust your speed in line accordingly? Do you feel when the car is close to its limits and only ask it to do things it can do? Remember, Dennis Machio talked about, we can only guide the car. We can't force it to do anything. Do you use the throttle to adjust the direction or path of the car? Do you carry enough mid-corner speed? And do you keep your eyes at least four seconds ahead of the car and ideally more? So if, 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 if you're not doing all of these things, then some of the things that I'm going to talk about next probably uh, <clears throat> uh, are premature. But, um, but these are just a reminder of the basics that uh, illustrate if we're doing the basics well, you know, you should be able to put a check mark by each of these. 
So if you do all those, where do we find some gains? Well, <clears throat> we start by finding more time at full throttle. Then we find ways to get into turns faster. We make every session count. And then we work on the most important part of driving the brain. <clears throat> so how do we spend more time at full throttle? Well, one place that's pretty easy is the example I used from David Murray. How do we get on the brakes as quickly as possible? We don't have to be particularly smooth, although we have to avoid upsetting the car. Um, <clears throat> so foot off the brakes, uh, off the gas, onto the brakes as quickly as possible. Now, a corollary to that that Peter Krauss has talked about is the beginning of braking point, wherever you're <clears throat> moving your foot off the gas onto the brake pedal, that should be thought of as the end of acceleration. In other words, our foot's on the floor and then our foot's hard on the brake. And there's the minimum delay in between as possible. You know, no delay, no coasting, none of that kind of stuff. So maximizing time at full throttle. Now, of course, there's some places where we have to do a brush brake or not a full brake, but the same idea applies. We're on the gas until we have to get on the brake pedal. There are places where you can give a short burst of full throttle or at least more gas. <clears throat> and you may gain, even if you can do that for a second or a half second, that can be worthwhile. At Mid-Ohio, you know, the S's, you know, are an example where you can potentially use a little bit more gas, whether it's on the floor or not. Uh, carrying a little bit more speed uh, is going to uh, is, is going to help. <clears throat> can you get to the full throttle sooner. Um, we want to, you know, be on a lot of gas at the apex in a lot of turns, unless you have a, a higher power car. And of course, it, once you get your foot on the gas and you're squeezing it down, you need to stay with it on the floor or stay with that progressive squeeze to the floor. If you're going on the gas pedal and then off, even if that just means backing off a bit, and then back down again, then you know you went to the gas too soon or you weren't on the right line. Uh, so that's a common mistake that people make when they try to go fast, but don't have the right technique figured out yet. So be aware of that you know, tentativeness with your right foot that tells you something isn't right. So here's some indicators you can use to kind of dial in your line and, and, and tell you how you're doing with the throttle. Um, you know, <clears throat> are you using all of the track at the apex? And, and are you having to unwind the wheel uh, to accelerate at full throttle? And is that taking you all the way out to all of the track? In other words, if, <clears throat> if you're not having to unwind the wheel uh, as you're squeezing the gas, if you're not using all the track at, at the exit, then you know you're le you're leaving you know time and technique on the table. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if this if any of this fits you, then you need to adjust your apex, you know, a little bit earlier, a little bit later to allow an earlier full throttle to use all of the track. And as you go faster, you may have to adjust. Now these are not big adjustments. These are you know a foot. Uh, type of adjustments, uh, you know, typically, uh, but, you know, be aware that these kinds of adjustments can help you get on the gas sooner and or harder. Now, how about how we're getting into the corner? Uh, how are we doing from turn in to apex? <clears throat> well, if you turn in and two thirds of the way to the apex, um, you feel like you need to get back on the gas to pick up the pace, uh, you probably turn in at too slow a pace. So you can turn in at a higher speed. <clears throat> if in that turn in area, if you feel like you're not close to the limit, you can also turn in with more speed. Uh, these two things may be correlated, of course. <clears throat> but how do we do that without scaring ourselves, right? I mean, now we're talking about the hardest part of going faster, um, where, where we want to get closer to the limit, but we want to find a way to sneak up on it without it being dangerous. 
So here's a couple of reminders of the basics to help us think about that. We, we all know how we're supposed to break in, in a heavy braking zone. Think about turn seven at Mid-Ohio, a heavy braking zone, right? <clears throat> well, if you're a beginner, you might break like this red line here where you get on the brakes and then all of a sudden you realize you need to slow down more and you get on more, you know, you stay, you get on more brake and then all of a sudden you come off. Well, hopefully nobody listening to this is doing that. Um, <clears throat> if you were to get on the brakes full and then come off full, um, you know, pretty good at the beginning of the brake zone, not so good at the end, the car is going to be very upset. What we want is a brake pressure graph that looks like this. And this is no rocket science, right? We want to get on the brakes hard, <coughs> quickly. We want to stay just below where they would lock at threshold point in a heavy braking zone. And then we want to gradually ease off. Um, and uh, the turn-in graph isn't quite right here. The turn-in would be sooner than is shown here. But um, we want to ease off and trail the appropriate amount in, into, the, into the corner. Even if it's a zone where we need less braking, we want to do the same thing. So think about turn one at Mid-Ohio. We don't want to brake as hard as we need to for turn seven, but we still want to um, you know, use what's a gradual release. And then this is what's more like brush braking or medium braking, depending on, on how much uh, speed you're carrying into turn one, generally a function of how much horsepower you have. So, <clears throat> If we have a balanced car with gradual brake release <clears throat> and we have our eyes up, we can begin to increase our comfort to carry more speed into the corner. So if we're balancing the car on the, on the right amount of brake and the right amount of turning, this is one way to get more comfortable. We can also <clears throat> uh, try an earlier turn in with slower hands. You know, on the left, you see kind of what our beginners are taught, you know, a relatively speaking, late turn in and late apex. Um, <clears throat> a faster way is to turn in a little bit sooner with slow hands. In other words, you know, we wind the, the, the car in, uh, you know, so we, we start the turn in and then we give it a little bit more. I mean, we're talking about fine adjustments here, not radical ones, but this allows us to turn in slightly sooner. <clears throat> and by using the trail off of the brakes to help the car turn and adjust the direction, you know, we can carry a bit more speed in into the corner. So how do we make every session count? Um, some of this will sound a bit familiar, I imagine. Uh, we set two or three goals for each time we go out. Um, we write them down so we know what they are. And we focus on those. That may mean we compromise or don't uh, try quite as hard the rest of the lap in order to work on a particular corner or a particular technique. And then when we come in, we immediately debrief you know, with notes. What worked, what didn't work, what should we work on next time? And we use a track map to write down you know, reference points, techniques, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you've all heard me say this before. So this is the way to you know, kind of work our way up and do it in a disciplined way. And then the last suggestion here is you know, develop a high performance brain. You know, starting with staying mentally focused when we're on track and to learn to recognize when we're losing focus or, or judging ourselves and have something like a keyword, like eyes up to get our focus back. Now, of course, we have to accept that we're gonna make mistakes. The mistakes are just another learning opportunity, right? But we wanna keep them small and single. You'll remember Peter Krauss saying that most large mistakes are the result of an accumulation of small ones. So we want to catch a small mistake, collect the car, adjust, and carry on. And if you find yourself with self-judgments, like I'm really bad at 
fill in the blank, you know, really bad at brake release. Well, turn that around, say I'm working on brake release and then figure out what you're gonna do to specifically work on it, but make it a positive I'm working on, I'm gonna get better at, and, uh, and that'll make a difference in terms of how you approach it and, and how much uh, mental energy and focus you're gonna have. You can also use mental imagery. Uh, again, I've talked about this before. Ross Bentley's big on it, as are most uh, pro athletes these days. You know, you know, close your eyes, imagine yourself executing that brake release. Move your hands and feet and head accordingly based on what you're doing. And think through not just the mental picture, but the sights, the sounds, what it feels like. This works because it's cheap and very effective. We don't have to be on the track to do this. We can do it in the paddock, we can do it at home. And it really helps us keep our skills sharp between events. It locks in progress. If you've recently done something that was better and you mentally now play that over a few times, it's gonna lock it in. And it's a good way to start on practicing a new skill. Um, you know, You can practice it mentally before you even get to the track. So to recap, um, have you mastered the fundamentals? Well, hopefully, uh, if you have, then here's some things to work on. More time at full throttle, some ideas to help do that, get into the turns faster. Uh, again, make every practice session count with those goals and write down what's working and not working. Develop a high performance brain uh, with focus on the track, use mistakes as a learning opportunity, and use mental imagery. I hope you can find one or two techniques and ideas here that you can apply at Mid-Ohio and at your and subsequent events, and that they help you, uh, you know, improve your skills on track in a nice, safe, incremental way. With that said, I'm going to jump right into Mid-Ohio turn by turn. Um, I'll say right up front, I'm a bit rusty. It's been a few years since I was there, but I hope you will find at least a few tips here. And certainly if you have questions, you can let me know and I'll be glad to do my best to answer. So here's the track map. I will point out that if you download the Ross Bentley track map, it has different corner numbers for the uh, uh, what's called the pro circuit, not using the chicane that's shown here um, with corners two, three, and four. This is sometimes called the club circuit and uses these uh, corner numbers. Passing zones for the lower run groups, you know, the pit straight, the uh, passing's on the left only. Between one and two, passing is on the left early, on the right later. The back straight, the main straight, is on the right side, but a car giving a pass is obliged to stay left at the kink to allow that to happen. And there's a passing zone uh, in Thunder Valley between turns 11 and 12 on, on the right side. That, of course, if you're in black or red, we have expanded passing. So there are some other sections where uh, we can pass, although not as many as you might think, given how twisty parts of the track are. So a quick tour around the track with a combination of uh, photos and uh, diagrams of the track. Turn one, fastest corner on the track, very fast left-hand corner. Um, we're obviously approaching it from the right side of the track on the pit straight. Turn is about where the bridge abutment is. It's a late apex. I don't like the way the line's drawn in this diagram. Um, um, and we really want to apex two thirds, three quarters or later along and run for some distance. Um, it does kind of go off camber with a dip in the middle uh, and then gets a little bit better toward track out. So that can be disconcerting at first until you get used to it. As we approach turn one, we obviously have a braking zone. Um, on, you know, This is a brake zone where most cars, we want to avoid a, a super heavy brake because we want to uh, keep the car balanced uh, uh, turning in. If you have a high horsepower car, you're going to need quite a bit of brake, but you're going to want to be very careful with uh, an early brake release and uh, 
get the car balanced for the high-speed turn. Turn-in is around the bridge abutment. Um, the yellow car is just taking a pass here, so he's not online. And the uh, in the photo, uh, I should be further to the right uh, for the for the turn-in at, at about where the the summit racing sign is approximately. <clears throat> As I mentioned, a long apex uh, along the curb that separates the track from pit out. Now the chicane and the keyhole kind of signature parts of, of mid Ohio, lots of fun. Uh, we're on the gas all the way to uh, the apex of what's called turn two here, that first uh, set of curbing. And then we want to break in a straight line uh, and then get back on the gas all the way up until we almost get to turn four of the keyhole. And I describe it as, you know, throwing the car into the turn uh, after that uh, braking zone or at the end of that braking zone. Um, in any case, we wanna bend the car in as much as we can. And then once we're on line, we wanna maintain our throttle through the first, our line rather with throttle uh, through the first half or two thirds of the corner until after the bump that's there, and then we can line up the apex for, uh, for turn five. Uh, this is what it looks like approaching the chicane. Uh, you, you can see a turn in cone on the left, although it's a little bit late. Uh, here's the entrance to turn two. Notice the curb is friendly here. We can drive right over it and straighten out this, this section. Um, this is approaching the keyhole. And here you see, it's a little hard to see, but there's a rise here. And it's very helpful for braking to break into this and then kind of relax the, the brakes a bit as we come over the top and, and turn, but use as much trail brake as we can to help the car turn uh, on, on the initial part of the, uh, uh, of the keyhole. The keyhole seems like it goes on forever when you first drive it <clears throat> because it is a long corner. And you know, we can you know, hug the curb if we like for a ways here, but we're going to probably end up using the gas, you know, to, to at least maintain speed or maybe gain a touch. But we can't really go to gas too soon <clears throat> or we'll screw up the exit. So again, we're looking for the bump, but this does require patience as we're, as we're going around. Once we, we're past the bump, we can start to wind the car in and then, you know, someplace around the point where you see the patches in this uh, photo, we, we can start to pick up some, some gas. But again, we wanna be judicious with that because if we have to get on the gas and then back out, then we're, we've lost time, not gained it. At the end of the back straight are, is turn seven followed by eight and nine. Eight is uh, madness. Uh, officially called madness because of the way the hill interferes with the corner. Some people have incorrectly called it the jump turn, but it, it certainly does have a hill. But let's talk about turn seven first. Um, <clears throat> this is a nice corner, but heavy brake precedes it because it's the end of the back straight. Um, there's good banking or camber in seven, so we can carry pretty good speed through it. But the braking for turn seven is downhill and bumpy. And so it's very easy to brake too late uh, here and end up in the gravel trap at the end called China Beach. And it will beach your car. It does suck cars in. So don't use this as a place to brake ultra late. You know, give yourself a little bit of margin and modulate accordingly at the end. Um, so it is a heavy braking zone. And as I said, not favorable conditions since we're going downhill and there are some bumps. Here at the apex, you can see turn seven's a nice classic right-hand corner with good banking. We can use the apex curb uh, uh, if, if we want, it's, it's, it's pretty friendly. Um, <clears throat> as we track out, we, wanna, we do wanna track out uh, all the way to the left, carry as much speed as we can through seven, let the momentum carry us to the left um, yes, that makes the approach to turn eight a little bit harder, but the, the, uh, whatever we give up entering eight is uh, more than made up by the extra speed we carry through turn seven. 
And so basically we want to carry speed through seven, let the momentum take us to the left side, and then just follow the left side up the hill uh, until about where the yellow car is in, in, in this picture. So here's what eight looks like overhead, but that really doesn't uh, show us very much. Here's kind of what it looks like um, yeah, as we approach the apex curve. <clears throat> you can see that the hill is totally blind at this point, and we, we want to run along this curve for a little distance. And then <clears throat> as, we, as we approach the top of the hill, we're going to begin to accelerate and unwind. Um, and we do want to let the car track out some as we go over the hill and feed some gas on. But we want to keep the wheel turned to the left enough to bring us back to the left side of the track uh, to set up turn nine, as you see in, in the line here that's, uh, that's shown in, in orange. So uh, uh, approaching turn, actually, let me go back one here. <clears throat> we want to let the car track out um, and, and set up turn nine because turn nine sets up the S's that, uh, that, that follow. So <clears throat> here is the approach to turn nine. You can see the, you know, the, the sealer marks and the rubber. You can kind of see where the line is as, as we approach. <clears throat> but turn nine ends up driven properly, ends up sharper than it looks because we really can't track out. If we track out and end up track left here, yeah, over in you know, this area, if we end up over in this area where we'd like to, then look how we've compromised and, and, and slowed down our entrance to uh, the S's up here. So we really want the car pointed from roughly where the, the picture is now. We want the car pointed as close to this bridge, the middle of this bridge as we can, because you know, kind of under the H or the O and Honda here, is the apex of, of that corner. And, and if we end up left any more than we are now, we just make this harder. So this corner requires patience and it's a good corner to trail break, but we really wanna focus on setting up uh, 10 uh, A and B, the S's, as we uh, think about driving through turn nine. This is what 10 A and B look like overhead. Again, they don't give us a good perspective because of the hills. Um, uh, this is a straight section, probably not foot on the floor in a, in a high powered car, but a lot of gas. We're gonna modulate the gas to carry as much speed as possible through here. Generally, the apex of 10B, we wanna stay a foot or a little more off uh, to set up the braking zone for 11, which comes up right after uh, 10B here. So, now here you can see the bridge and you can see why, you know, we, we want to be, uh, you know, uh, under that H in Honda as, as we exit turn nine. Um, again, we're on, you know, quite a bit of gas here, maybe foot on the floor, maybe not, but we can carry a lot of speed through this section. Um, let me back up. Um, but you can see the 10B is blind at this point and we can't see it. We know, the road bends to the right over the hill here, but we can't see it. And as we go over the hill, now here is the apex curbing for 10B. And this is the one we want to stay a foot or so off of. Um, it's no harm to run up on the apex here. It just makes the braking zone for uh, 11 a little bit harder. Uh, so staying out a little bit here straightens that brake zone out a bit. Now turn 11 is a challenging corner, also a lot of fun done properly. It begins on camber and uphill, but then goes off camber and downhill. Yeah, what's not to like, right? Uh, so we have to pay a lot of attention to the line and to our technique on this corner. It's definitely a corner not to lift on uh, as we go over the hill. <clears throat> it's set up with this braking zone from exiting 10B. And as I said, ideally, we'd like to break in a straight line here. Uh, it'd be nice to be all the way track left and line up this uh, yellow curbing on the left, but that's very difficult to do if we're carrying speed through, uh, through the S's. So we end up kind of breaking more on a, a bit of a diagonal uh, from about from where the car is in this photo to almost to the end of that uh, yellow curb uh, at point 
at which point we're going to turn in for uh, you know, for the for the corner here. We want to use the apex curb here, uh, and we want to stay on it for a while. This is another long uh, apex, and uh, uh, because the road does fall away, obviously, and uh, as we go over, you know, there's there's only so much room. So use you know use all of that apex, and and then let the car track out and uh, uh, and and head down the left side of the track here. Um, you can see turn 12 in the distance past the bridge, the track bends right, but we do want to stay left here. This is a passing zone on the right uh, and an easy place to get uh, one or two cars by uh, uh, after we've been through the S's, you know, which is a hard place to get uh, cars by. After we get under the bridge, we do want to then move track right. Uh, turn 12 doesn't require any braking or, or any other adjustments. Um, so uh, as we're moving track right after 12, we're getting ready to enter 13. Um, the turn in is kind of between the brake markers. The apex here is early to mid curb, um, but uh, the track out does go off camber. So we do want to make sure we nail the line here before we carry as much speed as is possible. This is a fast corner. Not as fast as turn one, but it's a fast corner. So here's, as we approach turn 13, you can see the 200 and the 100 markers. Turn in is probably, for most people, somewhere around the 100 or halfway between 100 and 200. Um, and the apex here again is a long apex and the curb is friendly enough. We can run on it if we want. Um, and you, know, you can see where the line goes along the curb here. And I don't think I have a photo here, but it does kind of go off camber as we approach the track out curb. Now, last but not least at Mid-Ohio is the carousel, turns 14 and 15. We're gonna approach from the right side of the track, literally right after we've exited uh, turn 13. There's a little hill that we're gonna break into, and then we can relax the brakes as we come over the hill and then get on them again a little bit as we get uh, down again to help the car trail brake and bend uh, to the right. Um, this is a compromised set of corners. We have to compromise 14 to set up 15. As a result, it's very easy to overdrive turn 14 and mess up uh, the entrance to 15. Here, we're approaching the carousel. This yellow is actually the track out curbing of 13. So you can see how close the corners are. If we carry a lot of speed out 13, you know, we've just finished uh, tracking out and now we got to set up for, uh, for 14. It's a little hard to see here, but uh, this right where the track bends right, it also goes up. There's this nice little rise, which is very helpful for braking purposes. We can brake hard into that rise and scrub off a lot of speed if we need to do that, then relax the brakes as we go over the hill. So here we're just started down that, that hill and we now want to begin to bend the car to the right. And um, again, you know, we can, we've relaxed the brakes a bit coming over the hill as the car comes down, we can apply more brake and help the car turn, especially if your car needs trail brake to, to help it turn. Here in 14, you can see the line. Uh, right where the sealer uh, is in the uh, in the photo here, um, just we can just pretty much follow that around. <clears throat> Use again a friendly curb. We want to be tight on this curb through 14 and be patient because we're setting up uh, 15 here. And if we get on too much gas too soon, uh, we'll run to the left and we won't be where we need to be. Here's the exit of that uh, curbing. And now we can see kind of where we want to be uh, for 15. And we're almost to the point where we can begin to accelerate. <clears throat> At this point, in entering 15, um, you know, we should be on a lot of gas and accelerating, you know, on onto the front straight with a late apex. Um, you know, we want to hit kind of the, the end of this apex curb here um, more than the beginning of it, if we're especially if we're carrying a speed on, onto the front straight. So that's a quick lap. Here's a couple of reminder notes. 
Turn one is fast, <clears throat> good place to use slow hands to turn in. Uh, remember to break in time for turn seven. China Beach is waiting for those who don't. <clears throat> uh, please treat turn 11 with great respect. Um, you know, it's fun to do, but it's also been known to eat cars. And both the keyhole and carousel are connected corners that require patience and technique. Uh, and they will reward that if you do them correctly, but uh, they do not reward you if you're not patient. One other thing I should have put on the slide <clears throat> about the track surface. Uh, track surface is okay in the dry typically, but in the wet, it can be diabolical. The, it's an old surface, it's been polished uh, for many years, and so it is incredibly slippery in the wet. So if you think about going out when it's raining or damp, uh, think again and think again. And then if you do go out, you know, think about, try to be as delicate as you can with the controls because the, there's simply very, very little grip in the wet. Uh, you will be shocked uh, if you haven't driven here in the wet at how little grip there actually is. So uh, if you're gonna go out in the wet, you know, you've been warned. Um, I'm not saying not to go out, I'm just saying approach it knowing that it, it can be literally diabolical and has eaten many cars in the wet who did not treat it with proper respect. So with all that said, uh, I hope you have a great event at Mid-Ohio. I hope you enjoy the track. It's a great track. And uh, I'm just sorry I'm not at this Mid-Ohio event but I look forward to seeing you at a uh, NNJR DE event very soon and uh, be safe traveling to and from the track and have fun.